I read a lot of fiction and things like that that kind of came up around this like whole genre of cyberpunk, um, which is like William Gibson uh, kind of stuff. Um, science fiction where people are kind of merging man with machine and it's this kind of very film noir kind of feel but in the future and it's just like a really cool thing and I've just been into it since I was a kid and I always thought man that'd be really neat and then you know cut to adulthood where all of a sudden I'm a programmer and I'll, I'm capable of kind of doing some of this stuff and I figure hey let's give it a try and that's where, where it kind of came from. I had found out through various sources on the internet that you could implant a magnet into your finger um, and it would allow you to feel electromagnetic fields like live wires and you know devices working and straight up magnetism, things like this. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. That sounds really cool to be able to like feel something totally new um, that's kind of outside of the typical spectrum. I have uh, an XNT chip here which allows me to store small pieces of data on it um, this one I have GPS coordinates to my house this is our North Star device it was implanted right along you can still see the scar this is the second one that I had implanted the first one uh, we had a little bit of a problem with the um, with the design of the board so it stopped it stopped working but yeah just a simple light and uh, it runs at extremely low power and so it'll like last for like five years and you'll just be able to run a magnet over it and it'll just turn on for like 10 seconds and it glows like really bright underneath your hand. When we wanted to go get it done, we went through piercers um, and body modification artists. So these are people that kind of operate outside of what you consider standard medical practices. And instead they kind of, um, they, they're more focused on modification of the body and, and this sort of thing. So, yeah, I'm getting one of these uh, in the next couple of days. Hey, people. I mean, we're talking cassowaries. I think people have lots of different ideas of what a cyborg is. My personal definition is where you have something that's integral with the human, that's implanted, a piece of technology, that gives the, that person extra abilities over and beyond the human norm. One man in tune with technology is the world's first cyborg. Part man, part machine. The first implant that I had was in 1998. What that did was identify me to the computer in my building and it did things for me. So as I walked down the corridor, the lights came on. As I went to my laboratory, the door opened for me because the computer knew it was me. And then coming through the front door, I said, hello, Professor Warwick, which was fantastic fun. Um, the implant was subsequently taken out. It was doing it for an experiment. And I have to say, I missed it. It's almost like missing a, a friend or a, a relative for a few days just to get used to being ordinary again. Nobody had done that until 1998. Um, so it's been the last 15 years or less that the biohacker grinder community has grown up. The last implant that I had, there were four consultant neurosurgeons involved. This was an implant going into my nervous system though. And it was the first time it had been done in any human. Um, since then, there have been a number of paralyzed individuals that have had the same implant. Kevin was plugged into a computer which monitored the nerve signals from his brain to his arm, receiving and transmitting them as radio waves. With the signals from his brain, Kevin could not only turn on lights, he could control a wheelchair. And from 5,000 kilometers away via the internet, he succeeded in getting a robot hand to mimic his own hand movements. There are a lot of people in the arts world who are stimulating the field and having implants for different reasons to try different things. Since I was a child, I was told that I couldn't see color, so I wanted to, to extend my perception of color 
but I didn't want to change my sight because to me seeing in grayscale is has many advantages so I just wanted a new sense for color and then I tried different methods when I was a teenager so this is an antenna that allows me to perceive colors beyond sight so instead of seeing color I can hear colors and I can sense colors that go beyond the spectrum so it includes infrareds and ultraviolets it also has internet connections so I can receive colors from other parts of the world or I can also connect to satellites and then I can perceive colors from space so it's a way of extending my senses beyond my uh, physical organs sensory organs I express my sense through different artworks I either paint what I hear or I transform into music what I look at. So if there's a face, I can transform the face into music because each face has different colors, so there's different notes or do sound portraits. And then also if I want to paint sound and I can, if I listen to music or a speech or sounds that I like, then I can just paint them on a canvas. I wanted to become the technology, so then I started developing it into a, an organ. And then once the organ was done, uh, I tried to find a doctor willing to surgically implant the antenna in my head and then I found someone and then he did the surgery and then it, it became an organ. What's happening with this gentleman is he, he lacks one sense and so he's um, having that sense replaced with another sense. So he's unable to see in color so he's substituting the sense of um, color vision with, with hearing. And so from what I understand, he has this camera here. It, it can uh, detect what the color is, and then based on the color, it'll make a certain sound. So green is a sound, yellow is a sound. This antenna is connected into some type of uh, bone vibrating hearing device, and then that is coupled to his skull. It's a common surgery. And um, the way it works is you implant a little titanium screw, basically. It's called an implant, and it goes into your skull. And then that screw that's in your skull actually has a little opening and a second screw goes into that. That second screw is called an abutment and that sticks out of your skull. And then you can clip on a device to that. And what that device does is it senses the sound and it vibrates and that vibrating is coupled to the screw that you put in the head. That vibrates your skull and it transmits the sound directly to your inner ear. We have the FDA in the United States to make sure that devices we put in are safe. And so I think most surgeons, just about all surgeons, would want these devices to be FDA approved before they would put them in, because otherwise there's just a, a lot of extra risk. You, know, you don't want to implant something that was concocted in someone's basement because it could fail, it could cause infection, it could cause all sorts of problems. I think that what is missing from this conversation in the biggest way is that what we do is not medicine right? And doctors do medicine, which is why doctors shouldn't be helping us, right? Doctors shouldn't be helping us because we have a situation here where, where this is about taking perfectly healthy people and doing additional things and, make, and doing experiments and this sort of thing. And medicine is about healing people with ailments, right? And so... I think that that's kind of the, the, the frustrating thing is that there is a whole new discipline that needs to be created and discussed, but right now the medical industry kind of says, like, we have domain over blood and guts, so we get to decide, right, who does the surgeries and who has to go to these piercers or people a little bit more off the map. And eventually it would be nice if we had a doctor um, working with us if we get real complicated. But right now what we're doing can easily be done and is done all the time in the body mod community. As far as like the, the biohacking aspect of it goes, um, you know, RFID implants uh, and NCF chips are really popular right now. Um, they pretty much are installed the same way that you have a dog chip. You buy an actual implantation tool. It's very black market. It's very niche. Uh, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, doing it to themselves and administering it to themselves because the biohacking community doesn't exactly have a whole lot of help from the medical community because, let's face it, the medical community as a whole are probably going to look at you like you're insane if you say, oh, I don't know, I want a computer chip installed in my hand. Everything else from the body mod side of it, it's still in its infancy. 
Properly administered, um, a subdermal implant's chances of infection, rejection, migration, etc., are so low as long as the practitioner himself remains aseptic. There's no greater or less chance of infection than any other cut or scrape. I can still feel a lot of the electromagnetic radiation around. Um, so mostly it's like from microwaves, from charging things, from uh, computers, from being on the train, uh, being next to anything that really emits that type of uh, uh, radiation. The reason why these magnets aren't um, are rejected by your body because they're, they're, they have this uh, type of coating that a lot of pacemakers have so uh, so it doesn't it, so your body's not gonna necessarily just like push it out. There's a sensor right here on the right on the left rail so I can feel it right there. And I don't even need to touch it I just need to hover over it. So um, how often does this happen to you when you're working on your laptop? Every few minutes. I mean, now that I'm more cognizant of it now, so that's why I just I try not to keep my hand too far to the left. So uh, it's you know sometimes it's just it it adds minutes to my to my work because then I have to wait until it goes back on, or if I have too many tabs open and then it's like closing and opening the screen, it uh, it shuts out. Any elective procedure is a risk, but yet if we want to get big fake titties. Sure, why not? You know what I mean? Because that's medically necessary for some people, I suppose, right? You know, and, and, and I think that we've slid that kind of concept under the radar where we, you know, have managed to alter ourselves in, in every way. But if you start doing it in a way that's like outside of this norm, I think that all of a sudden it's, oh, I don't know about that. Cosmetic surgery and reconstructive surgery to some degree exist upon a spectrum. But with that being said, even in the case of something that's co clearly cosmetic, let's say a breast augmentation or a cosmetic rhinoplasty, um, you know, the goal at the end of the day is still trying to produce a form, though idealized, that is still natural. I mean, we've all seen or see somebody that we feel had bad cosmetic surgery, right? Why do we think that it looks bad? Why do we think? that it shouldn't have been done? Why do we think, oh, that person crossed the line into not good or too much? It's because you've gone past that limit of what probably looks normal or looks natural. Definitely a difference between an implant that might have some type of benefit to the person or to other people versus an implant that has no defined benefit beyond sort of self-desire or even art or exogenous abilities that give somebody an advantage over someone else. I think that that's where you start to get to the slippery slope where people would say, you know, we don't think that this is a good idea. I have an implant that it's connected to online seismographs, so these allow me to perceive the seismic activity of the planet in real time. So every time there's an earthquake anywhere in the world, I get a vibration in my arm, and depending on the intensity of the earthquake, the vibration I get is stronger all over. So this is an extension of my, of my sense of movement, and this also connects me to, to the real movement of the planet. I imagine myself uh, alone in the planet and then I realize that movement uh, still happened even if there's no people. Because the planet constantly moves and not only it rotates but it shakes every day through earthquakes. I thought it would be amazing to transform this massive and huge movement to one body and be connected to the planet through movement and cybernetics.
The rhythm of the performance is detected by the earth, so earth is like the choreographer of the piece and it's just an interpreter. There's no real regulations that exist at this point, and we really think there should be, because that's what we need, kind of, to, to have a system in place here. Um, we use, F Grindhouse in general uses FDA-approved materials whenever possible. You know, there are silicones that are medical grade or other devices that have been approved by, by the FDA for, you know, in, in the body use. Uh, the reason we don't necessarily, Grindhouse doesn't attempt to get their devices FDA approved, first of all, it's a very lengthy, lengthy and expensive process that doesn't necessarily apply to what we're doing. And also, once something is FDA approved, it then becomes something that can only be administered by a medical professional. And since at this point right. we have to go through body modification artists, if we have an FDA approved device, the body modification artists will no longer potentially be able to use them. So that will really limit what we're doing. It's kind of a gray area. No one has ever came into a biohacker as far as I know and been like, please stop what you're doing, you're not allowed to do that. But some states have very strict laws against what a piercer can do. For example, one of our members, Jessica, is from Boston. And in Massachusetts, you can't use a scalpel, you can't really cut it, you can't even do a silicone implant like most body modification artists do because the laws are just very strict there. Whereas in Pennsylvania, we don't have laws that are that strict. So it varies by sometimes county to county or city to city or definitely state to state and definitely country by country. So there's a lot of things we need to take into account. No one has tried to stop us yet. Once they do, I think they're gonna start the conversation that needs to happen and I think this is eventually going to happen. So it's something that society needs to think about and needs to talk about and more people need to get involved in that conversation.